The National Desk, America's News, now. This day will go down in infamy. They will fail and we will win bigger and better. Former President Donald Trump pleads not guilty to 37 criminal counts. What's next in the case that could shape the 2024 race? Plus, for both uh, uh, vehicle passenger traffic and for goods movement supply chains, this is going to be a major disruption in that region. Chaos for commuters. The plan to restore the collapsed section of I-95 in Philadelphia. How long before drivers could get back on the road? And the new inflation outlook, the Fed's latest interest rate decision, and what it could mean for your wallet. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. We're glad you're with us. And on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. Debate over the new COVID booster, the shot targeting the new dominant strain this fall. Personal data protection, the organizations who could be tracking you and who officials say they're selling that information to. Abortion on the ballot, the election this week that could decrease access to the procedure in the South. But we start with the cyber attack against parts of the U.S. government. Homeland Security officials have confirmed the Department of Energy and several other federal agencies were hit by that attack. A cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency official said a Russian ransomware gang called CLOP is allegedly responsible. Now, the agency said the hackers exploited a file transfer program called Move It. Aside from the federal government, hundreds of other victims include those from higher education to state motor vehicle departments. So far, no ransom has been requested and the full extent of the attack is still under investigation. Right now, a recently declassified government report is shedding light on how the intelligence community obtains and uses Americans' data. And it reveals how loosely regulated those practices are. The National Desk Autor El Nishar reports on the legal loopholes affecting your privacy. A new frontier of digital data collection raising serious ethical questions within the U.S. government. Commercially available information, things like location tracking, purchase history, web browsing, is collected by data brokers and available to the public for purchase. Because anyone can buy it, the government does not have strict rules for how it can use it, too. As detailed in this advisory group report to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in January of last year, just published this week. The report says without proper controls, CAI can be misused to cause substantial harm, embarrassment, and inconvenience to U.S. persons. The military has purchased, for example, geolocation data gathered from Muslim prayer sites and dating apps in order to track users. One question the report raises, at what point does the collection and use of this information, like constant location tracking, breach a person's Fourth Amendment right, protecting them from unreasonable search and seizure? If the government is trying to investigate you or investigate a crime, they generally have to go get a warrant and that and be put through the normal due process. But this ability to purchase data from data brokers is essentially a big workaround. Bipartisan legislation has been introduced in Congress to block data brokers from selling data to the government without court oversight. Being successful and ensuring that there's accountability aren't mutually exclusive. The bills have been stalled for more than a year. The intelligence community argues it would be at a disadvantage to foreign adversaries if it can't access this data. For instance, the Department of Homeland Security has used it to identify foreign researchers studying in the U.S. who had previously unknown links to their home country's military. The advisory group that wrote the report is calling on the intelligence community to start cataloging the data they buy, set standards for how they acquire it, and better protect privacy. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Getting a check on your money as the Federal Reserve holds off on another interest rate hike. For the first time in 10 straight months, there is a pause, but it might not last long. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is warning of two more possible rate hikes this year, with the first happening as soon as next month. Today we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Looking ahead, nearly all committee participants view it as likely 
that some further rate increases will be appropriate this year to bring inflation down to 2% over time. For now, the rate stands at 5.1%. That is the highest in more than 16 years. Things are looking up for the U.S. economy as inflation hits its lowest point in two years. But there's a new study that shows not all Americans benefit equally. Janae Bowens is here breaking down the research. On average, white Americans have thousands of dollars more in wealth compared to black Americans. Now, data like this was the jumping off point for WalletHub's racial equality study. They compared several factors, including income, home ownership rates, and unemployment rates in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. WalletHub's experts say the racial wealth gap is because of past issues like Jim Crow laws and segregation policies, but also current discrimination that might be at play. Now, Alaska, Arizona, and New Mexico are at the top with the most racial equality when it comes to their economies. Washington, D.C. is the worst. Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, and Montana's economies also have low scores. Now, I spoke with James White about the study. He's a marketing communication strategist and says some changes at the hiring level will help with equality a more unique and diverse uh, background at these these tables who are making decisions as far as who's hiring for what role. I think that's a, a huge step in the right role and a little bit more uh, trans transparency. Now, WalletHub experts say policymakers should increase access to affordable housing, increase funding to HBCUs, and encourage entrepreneurship to help reduce economic disparity by race. For the National Desk, I'm Janae Bowens. Janae, thank you. A new Quinnipiac polling is giving us some insight into the most important issues for voters ahead of 2024. Averages taken across all parties show 30% say the economy is their top priority, followed closely by 27% who listed preserving democracy in the U.S. Abortion, gun violence, and immigration were also key concerns, but didn't reach double digits. Developing now, Pennsylvania officials are sharing their plan to repair and reopen the section of I-95 that collapsed last weekend. What you're looking at right here is the demolition happening earlier this week. Governor Josh Shapiro says the most efficient way to reopen the impacted lanes will be to backfill and pave over the underpass before building a new bridge. A 24-hour live stream is set up so the public can see the reconstruction in real time. Abortion access on the ballot. Virginia is said to be the next state taking up the issue in a primary vote this Tuesday. The National Desk's Angela Brown explains how options for women are disappearing in the South. A big primary in Virginia next week. A state Senate seat up for grabs featuring two Democratic candidates. One hinting he may support abortion restrictions. The other, a defender of abortion rights. That race could decide the fate of abortion rights in Virginia, the last state in the southern region that has not passed legislation banning abortion after 13 weeks. To understand what is happening to abortion access in the South and the role Virginia could play, just look at this map from the Center of Reproductive Rights. Southern states, deep red, abortion is banned. Georgia, bright red, a six-week ban. South Carolina and yellow. Governor McMaster signing a six-week ban now on hold as the state Supreme Court decides its fate. I believe that the court should <laughs> give it the okay to proceed. North Carolina and Florida also restricting abortion access. Virginia, one of the few holdouts banning abortion after 26 weeks. Virginia Senate Democrats defeating several separate proposals to restrict abortion, including a 15-week ban supported by Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin. It is clear Virginians want fewer abortions, not more. As abortion access disappears in the South, women are driving miles for care. Vicki Ringer from Planned Parenthood says often they are not welcome. We've heard even our own legislators say they don't like people coming here for abortions. Um, in South Carolina, they don't like people. Right, coming. exactly. That they have been um, watching the license plates. Well, that concerns me. That's, that seemed like a violation of privacy right there. Right now, all eyes are on South Carolina. The South Carolina Supreme Court struck down a six-week abortion ban just six months ago. Since then, the makeup of the court has changed. We now have an all-male Supreme Court 
And I imagine that many of the Republican legislators believe that maybe they'll get a different outcome. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. FDA advisors are recommending an updated COVID-19 vaccine to help combat the spread this fall. The new vaccine would target one of the three XBB variants, which are the current dominant strains of the virus. Advisors generally agreed the new shot should target the variant XBB 1.5. According to CDC data, that variant accounted for nearly 40% of U.S. COVID cases as of early June. Well, it seems to be able to uh, evade immunity in part, and it also is very highly infectious, so it's able to attach to uh, human respiratory tissue very quickly and spread from person to person very quickly. The FDA will now consider the recommendation before signing off on a final decision. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now, the likelihood of a Trump conviction and what would happen if the former president is elected again. The fact check team digs into the details. Plus, reselling recalled products. How officials say dangerous items for kids are being passed down through social media. Former President Donald Trump appeared in court this week in Miami where he pleaded not guilty to 37 federal charges related to his handling of classified documents. The fact check team answering a question many are now asking, could Trump serve as president if he's convicted? Donald Trump is the first U.S. president to be indicted on federal criminal charges. I'm with Courtney from the Fact Check team. The big question now is, can he still legally run for president? He can because there are only three qualifications listed in the Constitution. A candidate has to, one, be at least 35 years old, two, be a natural-born citizen, and three, have lived in the U.S. for 14 years, and he meets them all. Now, what if he's actually convicted? Theoretically, he could still serve from the cell. If he were to win the election, though, there could be some loopholes to get a around or even erase a conviction because the Justice Department has a long-standing policy not to prosecute sitting presidents. And he also wasn't convicted uh, in either of his impeachments. One of them was for January 6th. Right. There was thought about invoking the 14th Amendment, which bans anyone who engaged in insurrection from holding office. But that's never been used against a president, and legal experts are split on whether it applies. The bottom line is, even with indictments or potential convictions, Trump can still legally run in 2024. Okay, Courtney, thanks. And for more of this Fact Check Team topic, including links to the Fact Check Team sources, you want to scan the QR code you see on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. And the National Desk, Eugene Ramirez, also sat down with attorney uh, Karen Conti to get her expert opinion on how the federal charges against former President Trump could play out in court. Joining me now is Chicago-based trial attorney Karen Conti. Uh, Karen, a not guilty plea has now been entered. Do you expect a long trial ahead? And what does that mean for the Trump campaign? Well, I think it's going to take a while for this case to go to trial. I think that uh, the Trump lawyers are going to defend everything very, very vigorously, as they well should. I think they're going to ask for continuances and try to stretch it out past the election date. And I think the judge is going to try to keep it on track. Uh, but I think it's going to be very distracting for Donald Trump in his campaign. And I think that his campaign is going to take him away from preparing for this trial. So I think there's going to be a cross effect here. Sure. Busy, uh, busy man right now. Uh, if uh, he's convicted, a hypothetical here, if he's convicted and he wins the presidency, can he pardon himself? 
The jurors are out on that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of scholars that say absolutely not, and others that say yes, he can, and that it's not provided that he can't do it in the Constitution. But certainly, if he tries to do it, uh, it would go up on appeal, and it would take a while to come back down. So I don't think Trump should bank on the idea that he can pardon himself if he gets sure. convicted. Let's talk about the indictment here. His own former Attorney General, Bill Barr, has said, quote, if even half of it is true, he's toast. But now some are saying that there's no allegation that he shared the documents with any foreign entity so the U.S. wasn't compromised. What's your legal view on all this? Just because you attempt to kill someone and don't do it doesn't mean you didn't commit a crime. If he, you know, and he, and who knows who has the documents? I mean, there are 150 employees at Mar-a-Lago, and he kept his documents bed, bath, and beyond, right? So uh, who knows who has the documents at this point? And it makes our country look really bad. I mean, he was our president, whether you voted for him or not. And this could have compromised the, the integrity of our country and the safety of our citizens, not to mention the safety of people in other countries. So I don't think it's significant at all that we don't have any evidence, at least at this point, that it's been disseminated. Now, all of this is going before a Trump-appointed judge. Is there a conflict there? There is not, because the federal judges are either appointed by a Democrat or Republican, so you can't recuse a judge just because of the political affiliation. Uh, she uh, ruled in favor of Trump on a couple of occasions, and that was over; those were overturned. Uh, but I don't think there's enough here to have the government file a motion that would win to recuse her from this case. Karen Conti, we appreciate you, as always. Thanks so much. Sure. Take care. An alarming number of dangerous products remain in homes and businesses despite being recalled, many times leading to additional injuries and deaths, according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. While most are removed from store shelves, resale markets online are often fertile ground to buy these products. Spotlight on America correspondent Angie Moreski investigates. It's hard to imagine. This is a rock and play. A recalled product responsible for so much tragedy. That's been associated with the deaths of approximately 100 infants. Is still so easy to buy online. We have this system that's set up that's supposed to protect children and their families, and it's failing. Product liability attorney Dan Mann says that system failed four-month-old Cameron Vober. A baby boy from South Dakota who loved bath time. Thank you. And pulling his daddy's beard. Every moment was special with him. Uh, at the time, I just didn't know how much. In 2021, nearly two years after the rock and play was recalled, baby Cameron fell asleep in the rocker at his daycare and never woke up again. It's been extremely hard trying to deal with my emotions myself and handling it. Is the system that we have set up as a country to protect consumers and children failing? On many levels, we could do more. Alex Hohen Sarek is chair of the CPSC, the government agency tasked with protecting consumers from dangerous products. You worry about another child being killed. I worry about another child being killed every day. Spotlight on America searched Facebook Marketplace. Fisher Price Rock and Play being sold right now for $15. And found not just one, but two recalled rock and plays being offered for sale on separate days and other recalled products too. A boppy pillow, original, and it says sold. Like the Boppy Pillow Lounger, more than 3 million recalled after at least eight infant deaths. In 2017, the Consumer Product Safety Commission reported the average product return rate after a recall was just 6%, meaning 94% remain in consumer hands. We try and reach everybody, but it doesn't always happen. He says a CPSC team regularly searches online for recalled products and issued 55,000 takedown requests last year. Spotlight on America requested an interview with Facebook, eBay, and Craigslist. eBay and Craigslist did not respond. Facebook declined an interview but sent a statement saying in part, we take this issue seriously and when we find listings that violate our rules, we remove them. Imagine time doesn't make this any easier. No. Yeah.
The Vobers found the strength to talk about what happened to Cameron, hoping their tragedy will serve to warn others of the danger of inclined sleepers, especially with so many still out there in the community. Oh, yeah. After our interview, the CPSC reissued its recall of the Boppy Pillow, announcing at least two more infant deaths since the product recall in 2021. The commission urged all online marketplaces to stop selling it and sent another letter to Facebook specifically saying the company is putting its users at risk by allowing so many resales on its platform. I'm Angie Moreski for Spotlight on America. Angie, thank you. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now. Grand Slam surprise. How a Tennessee Little League team banded together to support a beloved member of their community. Plus, an incredible tribute to a fallen officer. How far one man ran to honor his colleague who was killed in the line of duty. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. We start in Tennessee, where a Little League team went to bat for a special member of the local community. Let's play some ball. For Scott County native Chad Carter, the baseball diamond is his second home. I do it because I love it. I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be doing anything else. Hey, that a boy. Chad has been umpiring for you, Triple SA, for almost 20 years now. Good decision, out. He knows 95% of the players' names when he's out there umpiring. Get a good pitch, nothing above your head, okay? But the main thing is to build a camaraderie with them to know that this is supposed to be fun and learn the game of baseball. He encourages us, he high fives us, he tells us good hit. He's just a really good ump. I mean, he's involved with every kid. He knows all these kids' names from every single team. GBG Southeast State U team wanted to say thanks to Chad for all he's done this year for the league. Thinking just a couple people might donate, it turned into hundreds. Saturday, he was presented with the check. This is from every team up here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you got me kidding me. With more than $8,000 being donated to surprise Chad. Thank you, boys. Oh, you could tell that really meant a lot. Over in Oregon, first responders in Portland advocating for a change in protocol to help manage the paramedic staffing shortage. They say teaming an EMT with some paramedics could help staff five more ambulances a day, improving emergency response times. Our response times are very substandard because we're probably short eight to ten ambulances a day of where we want to be, but we just don't have enough paramedics to staff them. The county commissioner there says more ambulances are needed heading into the summer months and the change in protocol could help with fentanyl overdose rates. Over to New York, where an incredible tribute to a fallen police officer came to a close this week. Retired police sergeant Brett Soboreski ended his journey at the Hall of Justice after running 50 marathons in 50 consecutive days in honor of his colleague who was killed in the line of duty. Ended greater than I had ever imagined um, with over a thousand people here and over 850 runners running the last three miles. It was just an amazing tribute to Tony and to his family. He ran through eight states along the East Coast, all the way from Florida to Pennsylvania. Still ahead, the rare animal sighting in the Northeast. Why scientists in Massachusetts are watching the waters for this massive predator.
Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now in Florida, officials say seven people were hospitalized after eating at a Japanese steakhouse. The food there testing positive for methamphetamine. Investigators say they're still trying to figure out how the drug got into their meals. Also in Florida, two women are facing felony charges following claims they tried to sell a million dollars in counterfeit luxury items. The women allegedly ran the scheme out of a pool supply store. Developing now, a group of four killer whales were spotted swimming just 40 miles south of Nantucket in Massachusetts. The rare sighting was made by researchers at the New England Aquarium. They said it's unusual to see killer whales in that area, let alone four. Researchers confirming the pod they saw included one male, one female, and two juveniles. Look right here. The last sighting of an orca in Massachusetts waters was more than a year ago in May 2022. Ahead in our next half hour, sextortion surge. The group's experts say are most at risk for the AI-driven crime. Plus, new details on the origin of COVID-19. The report claiming we could know who caught the virus first. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. We'll be right back after this. The National Desk, America's News, now. Crime ring cracked down the new plan in Washington to target organized retail theft impacting businesses' bottom line. Plus, the battle for health care in less populated areas. Why hospitals in the country are closing, leaving some Americans without care. 
and replaced by robots. The fact check team has new details on how AI could impact your job. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. It's great to be here. And right now, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland is mapping out a summer strategy to crack down on violent crime. Garland met with all of the 93 U.S. attorneys and the Justice Department's law enforcement heads this week to strategize. He says he's prioritizing the most violent cases, launching the next phase of major operations, including the U.S. Marshal's North Star and the DEA's Overdrive. Garland says more than a billion dollars in grants will support state and local law enforcement efforts to combat violent crime. We have also accelerated our efforts to fight gun violence on every front, from cracking down on criminal gun trafficking pipelines to updating regulations, to deepening our partnerships with state and local law enforcement. So far this year, the Department of Justice has prosecuted more than 6,000 people for violent crimes. Meantime, businesses and communities are falling victim to organized retail crime. The National Retail Federation reports thefts reached 94.5 billion in 2021, and now Congress is looking at a federal response. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, explains why some argue tightening the laws isn't enough. The five-finger discount, nearly a hundred billion dollar problem, and getting worse. When the rule of law is gone, it threatens our very freedom. Congress stepping in. The House holding a hearing on the issue this week. The fact that we are having this hearing in some ways is very disappointing. We used to be a country that adhered to the rule of law. The Combating Organized Retail Crime Act is currently working its way through the House. The bill sets up a federal response led by the Department of Homeland Security. David Johnston with the National Retail Federation says this isn't individuals shoplifting small items for themselves, but organized crime rings that resell stolen goods for cash and the thieves get violent. We have unfortunately had individuals, employees and consumers either injured or killed while shoplifters who are we believe are connected to these organized networks are conducting their thefts and trying not to be apprehended. During the hearing, Representative Barry Moore says changing the law might not solve the problem. You've got certain prosecutors that have just decided not to apply the law on the book, whether we change the law or not. If it's not applied, it's very, it's very ineffective for us to pass law after law, whether it be gun laws or drug laws or whatever the case if in fact they're not prosecuted. National Police Association spokeswoman Betsy Smith saying when it comes to these crimes, law enforcement often feel their hands are tied. One is very often corporate policy does not allow for the investigation and arrest of a lot of retail crimes. Secondly, when the police do make an arrest, uh, generally speaking, retail, th uh, retail thieves are let out on no cash bond uh, or the case gets dropped altogether. The National Retail Federation believes an organized federal response will help cut down on theft. They hope Congress passes the bill soon. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. As Ukraine fights back against Russian invaders, the U.S. is sending an, an aid package worth $325 million. As you can see, the State Department using presidential drawdown authority, which allows the Pentagon to quickly provide weapons from its own stocks. The package including missiles for critical air defense systems and more than two dozen armored vehicles. The U.S. has committed nearly $40 billion in weapons and equipment to Ukraine, since the start of the invasion in February of 2022. Developing now, China's foreign minister is urging the U.S. to stop interfering in the country's internal affairs. During a tense call with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, the official told Blinken to respect China's core concerns, like its relationship with Taiwan. The exchange comes just days ahead of Blinken's trip to Beijing. The U.S. and China are in a fierce race to become the global leader in AI, but the technology could be creating a unique competition within the U.S. labor market. The fact check team breaks down the claim that robots could be replacing you. 
Artificial intelligence is reshaping social media and the way we do our jobs even. Fearing it could have some negative consequences, lawmakers are proposing AI laws left and right right now. I'm back with Connor from the Fact Check team. One concern is job security, AI not just helping our jobs, but in some cases maybe taking them. Yeah, Eugene, that's right, and it's really kind of scary. But according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, around 50 to 70 percent of changes in wages since 1980 can actually be attributed to the decline in wages among blue-collar workers whose roles were replaced or downgraded by AI. And a recent report from Goldman Sachs revealed AI has the potential to automate roughly 300 million jobs. And some proposals now focus specifically on protecting jobs from AI? Yeah, Eugene, I found one that's in the Senate. It would give some funding to short-term job training programs to help people adapt to that new job market. Keeping that technology in check. Yes. <laughs> Connor, thanks. For more on this Fact Check Team topic, including links to Connor's sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen, or you can also visit us at thenationaldesk.com. Tesla's quest to launch so-called self-driving vehicles into the mainstream has been bumpy at times, plus a nationwide warning of sextortion schemes with the rise of AI. Earlier this week, I sat down with cybersecurity and privacy attorney Lisa Garber with new legal insight on the issues impacting you. Lisa, the FBI released a nationwide alert that scammers are using artificial intelligence to create deep fakes of victims in compromising positions. Can you tell us how this works and why is this happening? Good morning, great to see you. The FBI released this alert because the scam has become so widespread and rampant among many users of social social media, what happens is, is bad actors take benign images that people post to social media, dating apps, blogs, or other internet sources, and they use AI, machine learning, and deepfake applications to turn them into sexualized images and potentially even videos as well without any consent from the victim. Then what happens is they use these images and, and videos as blackmail, either to get money from the victim or to have the victim send them actual real sexualized imagery. And it's certainly concerning just to hear that. Who is especially vulnerable in this situation and what can we do to best protect ourselves as well as our loved ones? The groups that we always worry about are minors and young adults on social media. We have to be so vigilant about what we post and also the privacy settings that we use for social media and for dating applications. Remember, these bad actors can use very benign, safe images to turn into these sexualized imagery. The technology is easily available, it's cheap, it's relatively easy to use. And so we have to be aware of what our internet presence is. I tell my clients, Google yourself frequently and know what your children are doing online as well because they can be victimized and scared by some of the language these scammers are using in their blackmail messages. Right, like you said, you gotta be vigilant. Uh, sw switching gears here, Tesla's autopilot mode, it's been linked to over 730 crashes and 17 deaths over the past four years, according to a Washington Post analysis of National Highway Traffic Safety Administration data. How significant are these numbers? These numbers are alarming because they seem to go up significantly from what we've heard over the past couple of years. We have a variety of companies testing quote unquote self-driving or autonomous vehicles, and they are actually completely autonomous in some cities, especially Phoenix and San Francisco. But by the rule all across the country, we don't have real self-driving without human driver vehicles yet that are legally authorized around the country. Tesla has promoting this language of fully self-driving or autonomous vehicles, and they're using beta testing in different parts of the country. But now we have consumers complaining about safety. We have investigations taking place at different levels of law enforcement because some of these numbers are extremely alarming, and we have different categories of what it means to be self-driving. There's also some discrepancy in the auto community about the term self-driving. What are your thoughts on the use of that term? How does this technology actually work? It's fascinating because Tesla markets some of its cars as self-driving. You can pay extra for this self-driving option. In reality, you always have to have a human driver with two hands on the wheel to access these options. Legally, there are different terms for levels of when something is fully autonomous. And the 
Technology works through sensors, the Internet of Things, and processing of big data through machine learning and artificial intelligence. In general, we're not there yet. Tesla isn't there yet. And there are lawsuits taking place right now where consumers are saying they were misled by the language of something being autonomous or fully self-driving. Well, it's certainly a lot of interest, so it'll be interesting to see where this all goes. Lisa Garber, thanks for the information this morning and for joining us on the National Desk. Thank you. New details on a possible supply chain crisis averted. Thousands of dock workers on the West Coast have reached a new contract deal with port operators. The specifics have not been disclosed, but we are told it will affect roughly 22,000 dock workers at 29 West Coast ports. The agreement comes after more than a year of negotiations. So to come, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the indictment of former President Donald Trump to new details on the origins of COVID. Plus, an alarming uptick in certain cancer rates. The group experts say that's most at risk when we come back. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. History made this past week as Donald Trump became the, former, the first former president to be indicted on federal charges. National correspondent Christine Frizzau, how is this classified documents case playing out legally? Yeah, it's interesting. So prosecutors think they have a case that is airtight. There's 37 counts. And even Trump's former attorney general, Bill Barr, said last week, even if half of them are true, he's, quote, toast. Now, remember, we're talking about not just holding classified documents at his Florida residence. We are talking about refusing to give them up. When asked time and time again, it took a subpoena to get those. And there's people in Washington who say they're not even sure if they have all the documents that they want. And those include, by the way, and this is laid out in the indictment, they include uh, secrets, nuclear weaponry, timeline and details of attacks in foreign countries. Uh, I did also, though, have a chance to speak to former President Trump's former attorney, Tim Parlatori, and he sort of laid out the case that his legal team should be making moving ahead. This is not focusing on the counts, interestingly. This is focused on the prosecutors themselves. He says that he was in the room when those prosecutors uh, did wrongdoing, maybe perhaps not telling the truth, having conflicts of interest. He thinks the Trump legal team should focus on those prosecutors to either get the case dismissed or to get some of those prosecutors disqualified, that that should be his first line of defense in this case, Steve. And this is going to consume the next months and perhaps a year, year and a half. Of course, Trump is also running for president. So the court of public opinion, a key part of this, too. National correspondent Audra Elnishar. How are Trump's fellow Republicans reacting to the indictment? Well, Steve, you've got Chris Christie, Asa Hutchinson, absolutely unequivocally uh, saying that Trump should be indicted here, that he did uh, do something wrong. But the vast majority of candidates are backing Trump and his claims that the DOJ has got a two-tiered system of justice. Uh, and that may have to do with the fact that uh, a batch of polls that have come out since uh, we learned that he would be indicted uh, show that the vast majority of Republican voters agree with, with Trump, that he should not have been indicted here. Uh, a few candidates have even floated the idea of pardoning him should they win office. Uh, but that uh, uh, could be a winning strategy in the primary. But in the general election, when you look at polls for general voters of, uh, across the political spectrum, they're more split on this. So it could be a winning argument now, but we'll have to see closer to November of 24. Right. Democrats not talking very much about this, but Republicans, especially the presidential candidates, probably going to be asked about this for a while now. And seems like former President Trump will be talking about this for a while as well. Meanwhile, a new report digging deeper on the origins of the COVID virus. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, tell us about what this report suggests. 
We'll see if a few new reports were released uh, in the past week that seemed to back up the lab leak theory as the origin of COVID-19. The most recent one coming from journalists Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger. And what they did was identify patients zero, the first three people to have caught the coronavirus. And they were all three of them employees at the lab in Wuhan working with the coronaviruses. So that would seem to back up the lab leak theory. Now, another report was released earlier this week by The Times. That's a British publication. And they cited some US intelligence officials as well as intercepted communications. And what they dug into is what exactly was going on at that lab. And they found that the lab was doing research, looking into uh, how to mutate these coronaviruses. And this is one of the big things. They were working with the Chinese military reportedly on this, the Chinese military wanting to develop a bioweapon. So a little bit concerning there, Steve. Um, but both of these reports coming out this week seem to back up this lab leak theory, not the wet market as the origin of COVID-19. Kayla, Atra, Christine, always a great job. Thank you all for your hard work. Back to you. Thanks, team. Right now, cancer rates are rising in young people. The National Cancer Institute reports cancer rates in young Americans between the ages of 15 and 39 increased about 20 percent between 2000 and 2019 even as cancer declined slightly in older adults. Breast cancer rates for young Americans during that time period rose more than 17 percent. Myeloma rates increased over 30 percent and colorectal cancer rates surged by almost 45 percent. While researchers do not know the exact reason for the rise, a study published in Nature Review's clinical oncology attributed it to increased screening and early detection. Access to health care could soon become a challenge for millions of Americans. The National Desk, Angela Brown, joining us now with a look at a recent report which found hundreds of hospitals in rural America are at risk of shutting down. The numbers are truly mind-blowing. Nearly 30% of our rural hospitals are in danger of closing, a problem I've seen firsthand. Interviewing pregnant women driving for miles just to get prenatal care because the rural hospital closed down. Care vanishing in rural communities at a rapid rate. The Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform painting a dire picture, revealing more than 600 rural hospitals are at risk of closing, with over 200 at immediate risk. Healthcare officials say it may not ease up. The financial strain is there um, and certainly will continue to be there. This 2017 study found that rural hospitals had less than half the median overall profit margin of urban hospitals. Hospital size, capacity and limited services offered in rural hospitals generate smaller revenues compared to those in suburban and urban areas. Existing challenges growing deeper with recent staffing shortages, the pandemic, and the rise of inflation. Uh, reimbursement challenges continue to compound our cost pressures. Uh, payment rate increases are failing to keep up with this rampant inflation. More than 150 rural hospitals nationwide closed between 2005 and 2019. And what happens to people who live in those areas? They drive, sometimes even over an hour to see a doctor, not always reaching help, in time. It can be minutes between when either someone going into labor, a heart attack, a pulmonary embolism. These are really time sensitive cases where you don't want to have to travel very far before you get medical attention. The latest federal data says 15% of Americans live in rural areas and rural Americans are more likely to die from heart disease and cancer. And now they are facing disappearing health care in their communities. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Angela, thank you. Ahead here on the National Desk, bridging the gap. The new graduates skipping college and helping out the skilled labor shortage. Plus, stopping the traffic. The new FBI crackdown to catch drug dealers in states with less resources. This is the National Desk America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From thieves stealing tires off cars in California to teens helping close the labor gap in New York. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start 
with an FBI push to catch drug traffickers in West Virginia. The FBI has announced its first ever program that will reward individuals for turning in the region's most wanted. Samuel Rose of Martinsburg, West Virginia, is on the run from his involvement with the drug trafficking operation touching West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and the Dominican Republic. More sophisticated than your typical drug trafficking organization that really helps to fuel the crisis that we have in West Virginia. The FBI wants your help to get people off the street with an incentive of $15,000. It's difficult in a small market market like Martinsburg, West Virginia, to get that word out there. Rose is just a piece of the drug crisis seen across the state, and it has grown to its worst throughout the years. And just in 10 years, I've seen a huge change in the quantities of drugs that are coming in. Kilograms is what you see on the border. It's what you see in L.A. It's what you see in, uh, you know, Texas and Arizona. In West Virginia, we continue to be the number one state in the country when it comes to overdose deaths. How many kids out there are in the foster system? That is a massive problem in the state of West Virginia. It is all related to, to substance abuse. A neighborhood in southeast Fresno has thieves continuing to come back for wheels. I didn't think it was something that would happen in this area. There has been at least four thefts so far. But when we were driving around the neighborhood, we spotted a couple of wheelless cars. I'm kind of sad because I work very hard for this car. She woke up to her car swaying on cement blocks. It's going to take a while for my parts to get here. So, you know, luckily my insurance um, is going to let me take out a rental car. So that's what we're on our on our way to do. Now, she's out $3,400, not including the work and the tow for her car to get fixed. A viewer who wanted to remain anonymous sent us this video of their car's wheels getting stolen. In the surveillance video, the theft starts at 5.09 in the morning. And just four minutes later, the men have all four wheels off and replace them with bricks. If you can buy tire locks, invest in things to cover, uh, parts that are easily stolen like catalytic converters. Forty-two students. So this is how we roll. Putting pen to paper. We'll be working at time now. But they're not signing up for college. I'm going to be welding and fabricating. Cameron Plude, like the rest of his Wish We Boses classmates, has already secured a start to his career. Hard work has paid off, you know? I've been able to focus at something, and I'm able to start right out of high school. These soon-to-be graduates from the career and technical program were joined by their future employers at the signing table. Some bosses even brought gifts like shirts, hard hats, even a full drill set. I don't have to look for anything. Boses helped me out so much with just getting the internship and turning it over to a new leaf into a full-time job after school. While these students will immediately help close the skilled labor gap in the regional workforce, some BOCES students do choose to further their education. All of our programs also have articulation agreements for students who want to go to college and further their training. Still ahead here on the National Desk, something old and something new. The technology creating new music from some of the Beatles' original demos, when the music could be released, coming up next.
Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, Tuesday is election day in five states. You see right here, Virginia holding statewide primary elections while special elections are happening in Georgia and Missouri. Then the first day of summer is on Wednesday. It's also the longest day of the year with the most daylight hours. Most places in the U.S. will experience 14 to 16 hours of sunlight. Developing right now, singer-songwriter Paul McCartney says artificial intelligence is being used to create what he calls the final Beatles record by extracting late band member John Lennon's voice from an old demo. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI so that then we could mix the record as you would normally do. Fascinating. McCartney didn't say what demo Lennon's voice is being pulled from, but some guess it's an unfinished 1978 love song by Lennon called Now and Then. The new song will be released later this year. And that's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend, a happy Father's Day, and we'll see you back here next week.